Um, and I'm going to keep admitting people as they come in. So um, hopefully that'll be okay. So um, I just want to welcome everyone tonight uh, to the lecture. Um, I'm Diane Knispel. I'm the Director of Education at the Park City Museum. Thank you all for coming. Um, and I know it's a, a, lot, a crazy night with a lot going on, but we appreciate you attending this. Um, for any upcoming lectures, please check our website for more information on how to register. With this, I'm going to turn it over to Donovan Simmons, who's going to introduce Brian to us, and, um, and then we'll take it from there. Thanks again. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah you're welcome, uh, particularly on this night. It looks like we've over 100 participants, so that's a wonderful start to the, this is the first um, lecture in the Friends of Ski Mountain Mining History series for 2021. And those of you, I think most of you know who we are, we're part of the museum and our, our, uh, our goal is to help stabilize um, then the mining structures uh, around Park City. And uh, we've got a series of volunteers. Brian is one on the committee and I'm another, and there are a number of us working on this. Um, I say this is the first uh, in the series. I will introduce Brian in a second. Uh, the next one in the, the Friends of Ski Mountain Mining History Lecture Series is on February the 10th. And I will actually be giving that one. It's on the coal uh, activities in and around Park City, particularly Colville, the, the development of Colville, and also some of the uh, mine tragic events of the mines around Alney. Wyoming, you may not be aware of Alney, it's a, it's a mining town of over 4,000 people in the 1890s, just outside Evanston. And then following that, we have uh, a pleased to uh, get Professor Mike Nelson from the University of Utah, who's going to talk about um, the shafts, how they've developed the shafts. We have over 30 shafts around Park City, and um, Mike's going to talk about uh, how these were, would, were, were sunk and that will be in uh, April. Um, I'm gonna, uh, I'd like to introduce Brian Buck. Uh, Brian um, and his wife, Patty, are from Wisconsin. Uh, Brian received his Bachelor of Science degree in geology uh, at the University of Wisconsin, then moved to Salt Lake City, and he completed his uh, master's degree in geological engineering from the University of Utah. Uh, he worked in the mining, has been working in the mining industry for 44 years, uh, helping in the design and environmental permitting of new unexpanded mining operations all across the Western US. Uh, since moving to Park City 10 years ago, Brian has studied local mining history in Park City. And as I said, he's a member of the, uh, of the uh, committee, Friends of Ski Mountain Mining History, and is a an excellent authority on on the on mining in Park City. I, I do want to call out uh, Brian and his company Stantec, who um, uh, uh, donated a painting, the uh, Trevor Southey painting that we have. We're going to be at some point in the future when we get more sane and behind COVID, uh, selling this. And also, his company has uh, provided pro bono engineering services on the uh, uh, the two shafts. The uh, 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 Silver King and the Thane Shaft, which are uh, currently in quite serious condition. Anyway, without more ado, I want to introduce uh, Brian, and he's going to talk about John Daly and the Daly West Mine. Thanks, Donovan. And thank you all for attending uh, under these unusual circumstances tonight. Uh, let's go back in history together and talk about the story of John Daly and the story of the Daily West Mine, and I hope you enjoy it. So I'm going to options, and then I made get the presentation the going here. You can open it all the way if you wanted. See, you're off to the side. No, there's nothing. There was nothing over there. Okay. Um, Go to here. Go to your options. Donovan, does the screen look okay? That's good. Yes. All right, thanks very much. I can see the see. So to get started, I think we need to do a little bit of orientation, if we could. And this map is um, 
a map from the 1912 U.S. Geological Survey professional paper by John Mason Boutwell. And to help us get acquainted with some of the geography that I'll be talking about, um, here's the southern part of Park City, and here is Ontario Canyon and the Ontario uh, Silver Mining Company mill in this location, the Ontario drainage tunnel and work tunnel that goes back to the Ontario number three shaft. And then we have the Ontario number one and number two shaft in this location in Upper Ontario Canyon. Just a little bit to the west of Ontario Canyon is Empire Canyon. And some of the features in Empire Canyon are uh, in Lower Empire Canyon, we have Walker and Webster Gulch. And we have the Alliance Tunnel that I'll mention that goes from the, the mouth of Walker and Webster Gulch up under the mountain. We also have in that same neighborhood, the uh, portal of the Daily Judge Tunnel or the Judge Tunnel that goes from uh, this point in Ontario Canyon and goes 6,600 feet clear up under the mountain uh, where connected with the anchor mine shaft, uh, also called the Daily Judge Mine. We'll talk about that. And you have the Daily Judge Mill located in this area, the America Mine Flag mine in this area. So in Lower Empire Canyon, it's a busy place with mining. Up on Ontario Canyon and on the east slope of the canyon, we have the Daily One and the Daily Two shafts. And we'll talk about the Daily Mining Company. Uphill from those, we have the Daily West Mine and the Daily West Shaft. And around the corner and a little bit to the southeast, we have the Quincy Mine. And further southeast, we have the Little Bell Mine. So just to kind of get you uh, acclimated to the geography there, if you're not already familiar. Now, prospectors were exploring the geology of the Park City area as far back is the late 1860s, before there even was a town. The geology of the area includes veins of minerals containing silver, lead, and other metals. These veins or lodes exist deep underground, but they outcrop on the surface. And these outcrops were what the prospectors sought. In 1868, prospectors discovered lead silver ore on what we now call Flagstaff Mountain. And by 1871, the first shipments of that ore were carried by wagon to the recently completed Transcontinental Railroad at Echo, Utah. The Flagstaff property was developed into a significant underground mine, which then led to construction of the Marsac Mill in 1874 to extract the silver bullion from the ore. Now another outcropping of high grade lead silver ore was discovered in Ontario Canyon in 1872. The original claim holders sold their claims to George Hurst who quickly hired Robert C. Chambers as the mine general manager. Under Chambers, the mine rapidly grew into the largest silver producer in Utah. The Ontario Silver Mining Company also built its own mill in lower Ontario Canyon shown here. The mine was worked through three vertical shafts and the 6,400 foot long Ontario number one drain tunnel, all located in Ontario Canyon, along what we now call Marsac Avenue. Another deeper drainage tunnel, the Ontario number two, was completed later and driven from the Ontario mine workings eastward for almost three miles to Keatley near the current Jordanelle Reservoir. Although the Ontario mine was the largest and richest mine in the district, there were many other prospects and mine developments. Men interested in working at the mines flooded into the area and the community of Park City grew from a few tents, dugouts and cabins into a flourishing boom town serviced by two railroads. A visitor entering the early Park City from the north would be able to see the two railroad tracks coming into town, as you see here. The multiple smokestacks of the Ontario mill 
would be evident in the center background south of town. That's this location. The Marsac Mill with its tall stack would be a dominant feature on the east side of town. Although many of the mines were located out of sight in the mountains, there would be no doubt that the reason for the town was mining. The three Ontario mine shafts were located all together up Ontario Canyon, south of town, with the number one shaft located next to the road in the bottom of the canyon. The number two shaft was just a little ways to the north and east, and the number three shaft was on the west side of the canyon. Only the number three shaft with its current modern buildings is still evident if you drive up Marsac Avenue. All the early development of the Ontario Silver Mine was under the direction of Robert C. Chambers, general manager. Even when visiting the underground workings, he was clearly the man in charge, dressed in nice clothes and carrying his own oil lantern instead of using candles like the mine workers. He controlled all aspects of the mining operation and also had considerable influence in Park City history. His story could easily be the focus of an entire separate presentation, so we won't do that today. Now, one of the employees in the early Ontario mine was a young man named John J. Daly. Born in Illinois in 1853, he lost his Irish immigrant parents when he was just a boy, and he traveled west when he was just a teenager. He gained prospecting and mining experience in Montana in the late 1860s and Nevada in the early 1870s. He moved to Salt Lake City in 1876 and got involved in Park City Mining, where he and some partners invested in the Jones Bonanza Mine property in Bonanza Flat, south and west of the Ontario Mine. They were seeking silver ore, like that being mined at the Flagstaff, Ontario, and some other early properties, but they were not very successful. So he went to work at the Ontario Mine but he never lost his dream that the rich ore found in the Ontario mine extended to the west and south of that property. In 1881, John married Eliza Margaret Benson of Liverpool, England, and thereafter they raised a family of seven children. I'm sorry for the quality of this photo, but it's the only one of Eliza I could find. They lived in Salt Lake City and eventually built a mansion on Brigham Street, now called South Temple in 1891. This neighborhood was famous for the number of elegant mansions built by the most wealthy residents of Utah at the time, many of them with connections to mining in Park City. Daly acquired mining claims just over the ridge to the west of the Ontario mine in Empire Canyon. And he formed the Daly Mining Company in 1881 with support from Robert Chambers and others from the Ontario Silver Mining Company. The Daly number one shaft was developed on the east slope of Empire Canyon with the Daly shaft number two located further north and higher up the slope. Daly's mine hit the same load as was being mined in the Ontario and subsequently used the Marsac mill to process his ore. By 1893, the Daly mine had made more than $8 million and paid almost $3 million in dividends, making John Daly wealthy by the time he was 40. With inflation, that $3 million in 1893 dividends would be worth almost $87 million today. The Daly Mine was known for being well equipped with excellent facilities, such as those seen at the Daly Shaft Number Two, with a fully enclosed head frame and shops next to a substantial office and boarding house. The Daly Mine closely coordinated its operations with the Ontario Mine. They were connected underground to allow water and ore from the Daly Mine to be moved through the Ontario and out the Ontario number one tunnel into lower Ontario Canyon. 
While he was developing the Daly Mine in 1886, Daly contracted to drive a drainage tunnel from Lower Empire Canyon up under the Anchor Mining Company shaft over 6,000 feet away in Upper Empire Canyon. This tunnel drained groundwater from the Anchor Mine, but also had the benefit of draining groundwater from the surrounding terrain. And this must have been appreciated by John Daly as the tunnel was routed right past other mining properties he was interested in. Daly continued to, be, to believe in the mineral potential in Empire Canyon further south and west of the Daly Mine. He obtained other mining claims southwest of the Daly Mine and started the Daly West Mining Company in 1893, sank a shaft and intercepted good lead silver ore. So he built a new mill next to the mine shaft to process the ore as we see here. The early facilities consisted of a tall building enclosing the shaft in the background here and head frame at the rear of the complex, which was connected to the boiler house with a number of smokestacks, which itself was then connected to the mill in the front. Other buildings included shops, offices, and sleeping quarters for management and miners. Other producing mines in Empire Canyon included the Anchor Mine, southwest of the Daily West, the Quincy Mine to the southeast, and the Little Bell Mine further southeast. Shortly after the turn of the century, the operations of the Quincy and Little Bell Mines were connected underground with those of the Daily West. This photo taken later than the previous one from east of the Quincy Mine, looking west, past the Quincy Mine in the foreground to the Daily West Mine and Mill Complex in the background. Also note how the Daily West Mill buildings are significantly larger than the previous photo. This reflects the continual investment the Daily West Company made in upgrading its facilities. In the upper left margin of the photo, there, you can barely make out the edge of the mine dump and buildings of the anchor mine shaft located uphill. Cool. During the same time John Daly was developing the Daly Mining Company, another prospector and miner named John Judge came to Park City. He was born in Ireland in 1845 and his parents immigrated to the US in 1846, settling in New York. Judge worked in the iron mines in New York and even fought in the Civil War. He married Mary Harney, also born of Irish immigrants in New York in 1867. And together they eventually had five children. They moved to Salt Lake City in 1876. He worked at the Ontario Silver Mine for a time, but later became a foreman at the Daly Mine and thereafter was involved with John Daly on a number of mining properties. Here's a photo of the Daly Mine boarding house. The table in the foreground with the tablecloth is occupied by gents who don't look like mine workers to me. The man at the head of the table closest to the camera is reportedly John Judge. And the first man to his front at the table looks to me like he could be R.C. Chambers. While John Judge supported the Daly Mine, he was also involved with other mining properties. In 1889, he contracted to drive the Alliance Mine Drainage Tunnel, shown here from Lower Walker and Webster Gulch, over 4,000 feet to the southwest to drain the mines further up the mountain. He was also involved in the beginnings of the immense Silver Mine, Silver King Mine, further north in Woodside Gulch. Tragically, he came down with silicosis from his exposure to rock dust in underground mine workings, and he died at the age of 47 in 1892. He left a considerable estate to his wife, Mary, who managed it well and expanded the mining business into Nevada, as well as owning Salt Lake City real estate and part ownership of the Silver King Mine in Park City. She was a neighbor of the Dailies and well known for her philanthropy in Salt Lake City until her death in 1909. The Judge Building and the Judge Memorial High School remain as Salt Lake City landmarks of the Judge family legacy. 
In 1901, John Daly helped form the Daly Judge Mining Company that expanded Daly's interests into other mining properties near the Daly West Mine. Here is a 1902 stock certificate for the Daly Judge Mining Company signed by John Daly, its president. Shortly afterwards, the former Anchor Mining Company connected with the Daly Judge Mining Company, including the anchor shaft facilities and boarding houses shown here high in Empire Canyon. It also included that anchor drainage tunnel that Daly had constructed years earlier as a contractor. This tunnel, which henceforth would be known as the Daily Judge Tunnel, would eventually be used to transport ore from the Daily, Daily West, and Daily Judge mining operations to a mill in Lower Empire Canyon. So by the turn of the century, John Daly's dream of seeing the development of the ore bodies he always knew were present in Empire Canyon had come true. He had involvement in multiple properties in the canyon, including the Daly, Daly West, Quincy, Little Bell, Daly Judge, Anchor, and a number of other operations, including his early Jones Bonanza Mine. As if that were not enough to keep him busy, during the same time he was involved with all these mines, he was also investing in the banking business. He was a founder of the First National Bank of Park City and was a director of the Commercial National Bank, as well as the Utah <laughs> Savings Bank, both of Salt Lake City. By around 1910, Lower Empire Canyon was a busy place. This view, looking down Lower Empire Canyon, shows the facilities of three mining properties that operated simultaneously there. In the distance is the uh, head frame, the shaft, and the mine dump, for the American flag mine. In the near foreground is the light colored covered tramway on top of the mine dump for the Alliance Tunnel. The lower dark covered tramway connected the Daily Judge Tunnel to that Daily Judge Mill in Lower Empire Canyon. Here we see a view looking up Lower Empire Canyon from the Alliance Dump sometime after 1920. In the background with the parked autos is a concrete building housing an office and change house. And just behind that building is the portal of the Daily Judge Tunnel. And you can see the covered tramway leading from the tunnel off to the Daily Judge Mill down Canyon. That concrete building and the tunnel portal are still there for hikers to visit. Now the Daily Judge Mining Company continued to upgrade and expand its facilities in Empire Canyon under John Daly's leadership, including this mill. Like other mines in the district, the Daily Judge ore primarily contained lead and silver, but it also contained appreciable zinc, which was difficult to extract in the early mills. Over time, process upgrades enabled more of these minerals to be extracted into what are called concentrates, resulting in the large mill facility shown here. They also built an aerial tram from this mill, extending to a rail loadout in Lower Ontario Canyon to facilitate transporting the ore and the mill concentrates to the smelters in Salt Lake Valley. Here's a view of the same mill, but looking down Canyon towards Park City. Every building in this photo is now gone. But the aerial tram towers that you can faintly see over the Alliance dump beyond the mill are still standing today. As are some of the larger foundations for the former Daily Judge mill facilities themselves. Along with its success in extracting more of the zinc concentrate from its ore, the company built a zinc smelter in 1916 in Lower Deer Valley to process its zinc concentrate and produce a more valuable product. When the smelter was built, the Daily Judge Mining Company became the Judge Mining and Smelting Company. Now let's focus on the Daily West operations in Upper Empire Canyon. Like the Daily Judge Mill lower in the canyon, the Daily West Mill was expanded over time and the milling process was also improved and modernized 
to extract more of the valuable concentrates from the ore. The underground workings were deepened and connected with the other nearby mines, but also with the Ontario silver mine workings in Ontario Canyon over a mile away. This winter photo reveals the details of the Daily West mine and mill complex in sharp contrast as it was by 1907. Note all the buildings behind the mill and mine include multiple bunkhouses and boarding houses to support 400 workers. The head frame and hoisting works were still contained in the tallest building behind the powerhouse stacks, but the mill was greatly expanded downhill compared to the 1890s original mill we saw in that earlier photo. Looking up at the Daily West from just below provides another perspective of the size and complexity of the Daily West mine and mill facilities. Let's now discuss some of the underground mine features common to John Daly's mines. Because of the harsh winters and their wooden construction, many of the early shaft head frames in the Park City District were enclosed in tall buildings. Here is one of the Daly mine head frames showing a well-built timber structure and the two compartment shaft. The early hoisting machinery for these shafts was powered with steam engines, later converted to electric power. The hoist operator was a highly respected position in any of the mines. Early mining was, a, was very physical work, drilling blast holes, breaking rock, and loading ore and waste rock with shovels, all by the light of candles. Here's a miner and his helper working along a vein or load of shiny ore. The Daily West mine had both load and bedded type ore bodies. The Daily West was known for its up-to-date mining practices, including early employment of early percussion air drills, which greatly increased the rate at which blast holes could be drilled. Here's a photo showing miners working a tunnel heading the miner and his helper are working on top of a pile of broken rock called muck from a prior blast, while the two muckers are ready to load out the broken rock. Note the rock dust covering all the surfaces at the work site. Many miners suffered illness from breathing the dust, which led to what they called miners consumption, primarily what we call silicosis today. The mining companies quickly learned to introduce water into those air drills to cut down on the dust in the workplace. As the ore was removed from the underground openings called stopes, timbers were installed as needed to support the openings, which sometimes were backfilled with waste rock excavated elsewhere in the mine. The timber men worked very hard as each of these heavy timbers were fitted and wrestled into place by hand. Tunnels were driven at regular vertical intervals called levels to gain access to the ore bodies. These were referred to as their depth in the mine shaft. In the early Daily West mine, the main levels were the 900, 1200, 1400, and 1500 levels. Levels were used to transport ore or waste rock. Here we see an early or shoot, possibly connected to a stove, and the miners are queuing up to load mine cars that typically could carry a ton of rock. They would push these cars along the tracks of the level to the shaft where the cars would be lifted to the surface. Alternatively, the cars might be dumped into a bin underground, which would then direct the broken rock to other locations in the mine. In the Daily West mine, all the ore was directed to the 1200 level and either lifted to the surface for milling or shipped directly from the mine underground through the Ontario number one tunnel. More on this later. Here is a tunnel showing the timber supports called sets. The tracks for the ore cars, a large ventilation tube hanging from the roof or back of the tunnel and a compressed air pipe lying next to the tracks. All these old photos show the miners still using candles for light, which were replaced in the early 1900s 
by oil lamps and carbide lamps. The Daily West also introduced electric lighting and power into its facilities by around 1902. The Daily West mine was no different than many of the other mines in Park City in that the deeper the mine was developed, the more groundwater made its way into the mine. This water had to be removed from the mine with pumps or by gravity drainage out of tunnels. This photo shows water entering into one of the Daily West tunnels. Certain mine tunnels were used to drain water out of the mine. These were often designed with water flumes located under the rails. So the miners did not have to wait about in water all day, unlike these soggy chaps. Note the rain slickers and oil lamps, suggesting these miners had to deal with very wet conditions. The Daily West had two main drainage levels. The earlier one being on the 1200 level that drained water two and a half miles out the Ontario number one tunnel into lower Ontario Canyon. And a later one on the 2100 level, which connected with the Ontario number two drainage tunnel. And that carried the water all the way to Keatley, about four miles to the Northeast of the Daily West shaft. The Daily West mine was connected underground at its 1200 level to the Daily mine and the Ontario mine with a long tunnel. High grade ore from the Daily West would make the two and a half mile trip through this tunnel in ore trains to the portal of the Ontario number one tunnel in lower Ontario Canyon, where the ore was then loaded into rail cars and shipped to the smelters in, Park City, in Salt Lake City. Now mill grade ore was lifted in the Daily West shaft to the surface where it was processed in the Daily West mill. The high grade granular product of the milling process, the concentrates, was then put back into cars and lowered back down the shaft. So it could also be hauled in trains out to the Ontario number one tunnel. Here's a photo of one of those early trains with the mule or horse barely discernible at the front of the train. Later on, these trains were pulled with electric locomotives. Here's a photo of another ore chute with heavy timbers along a level. Atypically, this photo was inscribed with the name of the miner captured in the photo. His name is Chris P. Satterup. And the photo was inscribed that he was later killed in the Daily West mine disaster. I think his face is somewhat haunting. But what about that guy in the shadow on the left side of the photo? At 11.20 p.m. on the night shift of Tuesday, July 15, 1902, the Daily West shaft operator sensed a rumbling from underground. Miners on the 900 level called for the cage and were lifted from the mine to report that an explosion had happened below the 900 level. It was also found that one compartment of the shaft was damaged, so only one compartment was still usable. Volunteers were lowered to the 1200 level where explosives gas was very strong. They were then lowered to the 1400 level where the gas was also present. They decided to evacuate the mine. Some of the miners that were lifted to the surface were in bad shape because of exposure to poisonous gas. Men on the surface rushed to the hoist house, clamoring to go down into the mine to help their coworkers. Some of these volunteers had to be rescued themselves when they too were overcome by the gas and three of them perished. Rescue work was interrupted for a time because of the lethal gas concentration in the Daily West workings. This gas passed through the connecting tunnel with the Ontario mine and claim more victims along the way. Now to explain, the detonation of even limited amounts of blasting agents results in the generation of carbon monoxide and nitrogen monoxide, which then converts to nitrogen dioxide, which is much more toxic than carbon monoxide. In normal mining practice, time was allotted after each blast to allow the explosives gases to be removed by the mine ventilation system before miners re-entered the blast area to remove the broken rock 
and to continue mining. In the case of the Daily West explosion, it was estimated that tons of blasting agents somehow detonated all at once in the underground explosives storage magazine on the 1200 level. The gas created in the explosion then traveled through the mine and connecting tunnels as the ventilation moved it out of the mine. Miners working in the tunnels that were in the path of high concentrations of the gas were asphyxiated and poisoned. The article in the Deseret News the next day after the explosion described the scene at the Daily West shaft this way. There were hundreds of brave volunteers, scores of them willing to go down into the depths and risk their own lives in the work of rescue. They fairly filled the Daily West shaft house to overflowing. Every man who went down with the first rescuing party was overcome by the deadly gas. As the dead were hoisted to the surface and laid out, they were quickly identified by relatives, comprising wives, children, brothers and sisters, and friends. The bodies as they lay in the night air presented an uncanny and gruesome spectacle. A total of 38 miners were killed that night and as many injured, six of the dead were working in the Ontario mine at the time so potent was the gas moving from the Daily West workings into the connected Ontario workings. The Daily West mine was shut down and recovery operations continued for the next two days. Following this, it took a number of weeks to repair the parts of the mine damaged by the explosion. The Park City community turned out to support the families affected. Mortuaries from Salt Lake City assisted with the funeral arrangements including this somber procession of hearses down Main Street in Park City. 20 funerals for the deceased were held in Park City. Many of the caskets were shipped home by rail to the families of the deceased, while others were laid to rest in Park City. Seven of the miners that were killed in the disaster were buried in this location of the Glenwood Cemetery in Park City. All were reportedly immigrants from Ireland. An, an investigation was launched into the explosion and the Daily West mine was exonerated, but it and other mining companies changed their explosives handling to not store large quantities of blasting agents underground. Instead, they built explosives magazines on the surface near the mine openings like this one in Lower Empire Canyon today. The company provided financial aid to the families of the miners killed in the accident. But this tragic event is forever part of the history of Park City and the Daily West Mine. On July 14, 1962, the 50th anniversary of the Daily West disaster, the Deseret News published an interview with then 80-year-old Lawrence Berry, who remembered the night of the explosion and its aftermath as followed. I was a young man then, just past 20, and I had been to a Saturday night dance. On my way home, as I reached City Hall, a siren mounted there began to blow. A man rushed by and yelled, there had been an explosion in the Daily West on the 1200 level. Approximately 200 men worked that shift, and many of them were stricken by the poison gas. We brought the dead out. Some of them never knew what struck them down. They were still holding their tools and looked as if they had just gone to sleep. Families claimed their kin. Every day, the remains of out of town boys were sent home on special railroad cars. The town folks turned out to see them off on their last journey home. The mine restored operations, but bad luck struck the Daily West again on December 28, 1913, when a fire destroyed the hoisting and milling facilities shutting down the mine until those facilities were rebuilt in 1914. A new steel head frame was built along with new hoisting building and equipment. All the new hoist and mill equipment was powered with electricity, eliminating the former steam boiler house. The upgraded facilities are seen in this photograph of the 1914 head frame and shops. Well before this was taken, 
John Daly left the management of the Daly West to others. And he retired completely from Park City Mining altogether in 1907. In 1918, it was determined to halt milling operations and the Daly West ore would thereafter be processed in the Daly Judge Mill in Lower Empire Canyon. The Park City Mining and Smelting Company was formed in 1922, which included the operations of the former Daly West and a number of other mining companies in Empire Canyon and the independent the Daily West Mining Company passed into history. By around 1931, the mining company ceased operation of the former Daily Judge Mill, but continued mining and moving ore out of the Daily Judge Tunnel. This ore was transported to the rail siding in Ontario Canyon with that aerial tramway built in 1925. The mill was demolished in 1939 but ore production out of the tunnel and the tramway shown here continued until 1952. In 1958, the remaining portions of the former mill and tramway facilities burned down. The concrete foundations for the mill and the tram facilities in Lower Empire Canyon are still evident to hikers up the canyon today if you look for them. The old Daily West facilities fell into disrepair and partially burned, leaving just the head frame, hoisting works, and some other mine buildings on top of the old mine dump. When Park City Ventures and later Naranda Mining Company rebuilt the Ontario Silver Mine in the late 1970s and early 1980s, they maintained the Daily West shaft for emergency access and ventilation of the connected underground workings. The shaft continued to be used for ventilation of the Ontario number two drainage tunnel. The large water flow from that tunnel was eventually taken over by the Jordanelle Special Services District. The Deer Valley Resort expanded into Upper Empire Canyon in the late 1990s, which eventually resulted in the Daily West shaft site being surrounded by the ski resort. Construction of the Montage Deer Valley Hotel commenced near the former Daily West mine in 2007. This photo was taken during construction of the hotel and shows what remained of the former Daily West surface facilities at that time. Just the shaft, the 1914 steel head frame and a modern hoist building. As shown in this fall photo by local photographer Bill Tafiri, the 1914 head frame continued to stand strong for a hundred years, marking the location of the historic Daily West shaft. It was an icon of the former greatness of Park City mining history, admired by visitors and cherished by the local community. Now mine shafts require ongoing maintenance to survive the effects of mother nature. Unfortunately, the supports in shafts can weaken over time. And this eventually caught up with the Daily West the uppermost part of the shaft caved in on the evening of May 13, 2015, which created a sinkhole that took the head frame with it. When the head frame followed the caving ground into the shaft, the legs of the head frame were damaged. Cranes picked up the head frame and laid it on its side where it has remained since 2015. The caved shaft opening was capped with steel beams and concrete and backfilled with earth so just a small graded opening is left of the former shaft. The steel building that once housed the hoisting equipment was damaged when the head frame collapsed. So the building was removed. The hoisting equipment has sadly been exposed to the negative effects of weather since 2015. But things are looking up for the old Daily West head frame. Deer Valley Resort acquired the shaft property in 2020. The municipal government of Park City, the Empire Pass Master Owners Association and Deer Valley Resort are now collaborating to fix and raise the head frame near the shaft location and to cover the hoisting machinery. Watch for more news on this project later this year. It will be a happy day when we can again be able to see this important piece of mining history standing tall. 
So the story of John J. Daly is forever connected with the mining history of Park City. His Daly West mine is famous for its quality and riches and infamous for the tragic disaster that happened there. And the relevance of the Daly West head frame continues to this day. But in addition to his business interests in Park City, John Daly also helped develop Salt Lake City. He served on the Salt Lake City Council and the Board of Regents of the forerunner of the University of Utah. He was involved in Salt Lake City real estate, building two hotels and an office building. He participated in Utah politics and was also a founder and past president of the Alta Club. John and his wife, Eliza Margaret, were parishioners and early contributors for the construction of the Cathedral of the Madeline in Salt Lake, which was located near their home. They were joined by other neighbors of the day that were also famous for their connections with Park City Mining, including Thomas Kearns, Mary Judge, James Ivers, and David Keith. The Dailies lived in Salt Lake City until 1917 when they moved to Los Angeles. He died at home there at the age of 74 on October 22nd, 1927. Eliza Margaret lived to the age of 81 when she died from injuries in a traffic accident in Los Angeles in 1939. I'd like to offer you a description of John Daly by a Utah writer named Edward Tullidge, who was a contemporary of John Daly. And he wrote, personally, Mr. John Daly is a fine physique in his character, self-poised in judgment, a constant student and devotee of business, sound and sagacious in political affairs, reticent in conversation, but decided in expression. In business and in friendship, his well-known integrity, purity, and truth cause his judgment to be consulted and his friendship to be sought. By his own industry and energy, he has become not only one of the first citizens of Park City, but one of the foremost mining men of the West. So before concluding, let me mention the work of the Park City Museum and its volunteer committee, the Friends of Ski Mountain Mining History. The museum and the committee are dedicated to saving the significant remaining mining structures around Park City and educating the public as to the rich mining history of the local area. And this talk is part of that mission. You can learn more about the work of these dedicated folks their accomplishments so far and how you can support their work at the Park City Museum website at parkcityhistory.org. Thank you so much for your interest in John Daly and the Daly West Mine. And I'll turn it back to you, Diane. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Brian. That was very informative, um, really enjoyed it. Um, Donovan, did you have um, some kind of slide that you wanted to talk about um, so that, you know, I'm not taking over here? <laughs> so, Donovan, we can't hear you, so... Um, uh, let me see if I can unmute you. Hold on. Sorry, everyone. Um, I, while I have all of you here, I just want to apologize for some technical difficulties we've had tonight. Um, and uh, we are recording this and we will put this online. So if you missed a part of it, we will... Um, uh, we will, um, we will certainly, um, you know, take it from there. Okay. Okay. So Donovan, I don't have, I, I um, let me see if I can, um, why, I don't know why it's doing this. So can you unmute yourself, Donovan? Nope. Nope. That's interesting because it's not okay. Uh, 
uh, make host. So I made Donovan try, see, no. Okay. All right. Um, there were uh, a couple of questions. Um, so, uh, and thank you for all of you for coming tonight. Like I said, I do appreciate it. Um, let's see. How would they know there was silver was one of the questions very early on. Um, Brian. Sure. Um, is it okay for me to keep sharing this? Uh, yeah, Dan, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Let's see if I can get it's to on. It's our billboard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I tell you, the, the early miners recognized the, the silver ore when they saw it. And they would take samples of the, uh, the ore that they might knock off of an outcrop or underground if they're sampling the ore that they encounter and have that assayed. So there'd be chemical analyses and they were able to analyze the amount of silver that was in the ore. And the earliest uh, high grade ores that were mined in the district were amazing in the amount of silver that was present in the ore. Uh, there's reports of assays of as much as and more than 400 ounces of silver per ton of ore. So if you think about those ore cars that I showed you a picture of, they're not very big. And a ton of ore in one of those ore cars containing 400 ounces of silver, that's pretty rich stuff. But Diane, you're muted. Uh, go ahead. Can you hear me? We can hear you, but we can't hear Diane. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, can, I unfortunately can't see the questions either. I don't know if you can see them, Brian. I, I've, I've lost those as well. So. so Diane is back. Okay, so I'm back. Um, let's go up here, see what the questions were. Um, let's see. Can you review the map with reference to locations in current Park City? That was one of the first slides you did. Sure. Let me go back. Ah. Can you all see that? That's good. All right. So these streets up at the very top of the map are the very south end of uh, Park City. And um, I'm not sure. Uh, and so all the terrain that I was talking about is south of Park City. You know, I kept talking about the Ontario silver mine and the Ontario uh, tunnel where all that ore and water was drained out. That's this tunnel. And you can still see that if you drive up Marsac Avenue, uh, just below the location of the old mill, you can. In, in fact, there's a uh, sign there uh, to alert you to the fact that you're looking at the portal of the Ontario number one tunnel. So anyway, that's the Ontario Canyon area. And then this whole Empire Canyon area that we've just been talking about is this area up uh, where the montage is now located. And uh, you can walk up there if you, if you go up Daly <laughs> Avenue and down to the gate at the mouth of uh, the canyon, which is about I think probably around here, uh, you can hike all the way up there and you can see the, uh, the old foundations of the uh, Daily Judge Mill and you walk further up and you'll see that concrete building and the, and the portal to the Daily Judge Tunnel. And if you uh, walk further up the canyon, you'll see the um, Daily West head frame uh, sitting up in this location. And of course the montage is right now sitting right about here. Does that help? That helps. Um, next question was, did they pay each other for access through their tunnels? How did they track whose or was whose? <laughs> Good question. There was money made by all of these mines collaborating together. And, you know, as I described, the mines were uh, very intimately connected underground. 
And imagine here, with this map, we'll keep this map up. The, here's the Daily West shaft. And there were connections from the Daily West shaft up towards the Daily number one, and then clear over to the uh, Daily number three, and then out this tunnel. And for the, um, and, and so that was good for the Daily West because it didn't have to haul all that stuff down Empire Canyon and deal with the weather. It was all done underground. And yes, they paid a lease agreement fee uh, for the tonnage that they shipped out. And of course they kept track of the tonnage of first grade ore and concentrates that they sent out through that tunnel. And they had to pay a fee uh, per ton for that. They also paid a fee for the drainage of water out of the uh, Ontario number one, and then later the Ontario number two, uh, the mines that were connected to those drainage tunnels. And those drainage tunnels were paid for. They were driven and paid for by the Ontario silver mine and the Daly mine. They're, they're the ones that put up the capital to drive those tunnels. And they, uh, they charged a fee uh, to drain water out. I wish I could tell you exactly how they kept track of that, but uh, uh, they did make uh, revenue by charging those fees. Great. Um, there were a lot of thank yous to you, Brian. They loved your storytelling. They loved the slides. They were very happy with the lecture. Um, and then we had two more. We had um, Carol Larimore would like to um, comment about his father, Ted, who worked there in the 50s. Ted, um, Carol, Hi. go on. I'm Ted Larimore, not uh, Carol. Oh, I'm but, sorry. Uh, I was born in Park City in 1953, so grew up there until career and other things uh, forced me to move away. But my father was a miner from the late 40s to the early 60s. And when he worked, at least in the Daily West part of the mine system, the shaft was 2,100 feet deep. And unlike uh, most commercial building elevators shafts, number one, it wasn't truly vertical. He said there was a lot of clanking as the cage went down the shaft as far as it just hitting the sides of the, the shaft. And um, as opposed to most commercial elevators that have multiple cables, most mining uh, shafts had a single cable and the, the speed of descent was a lot faster than what you might experience uh, today. So he said that by the time they reached the lower levels and then the, the hoistman uh, started uh, breaking, the, uh, the, sh the cable would actually stretch like a yo-yo and they'd almost go to one level lower than where they were supposed to and then come back up and go back and forth like that until they finally came to a stop. So that was one of his experiences uh, working there. Another uh, uh, aside, when, when I was a kid, the culinary water supply of Park City was from, from one of the drain tunnels in that system. I think they, one of the anchor mine tunnels where it was basically uh, drained by gravity and that's what we drank as a kid. Um, so those are my two comments about uh, growing up then. Hey, Carol, thanks so much for that. And uh, just two comments. We still drink water out of that tunnel. It's the That's Daily true. Judge Tunnel. And the Jordanelle uh, District uh, takes care of that for the city. And the water is collected inside the tunnel. You can't see water coming out of the tunnel portal. It's collected just inside the portal. I've been in there to see that. And it's routed underground in a pipe to a, a massive tank that's, that's right there where the old mill used to be. And from that tank, the water is distributed down into town. And of course it's treated um, before it's distributed to the taps. Um, and the overflow from that uh, tank uh, goes into the creek. And so when you hike in the canyon and you see all that lovely water coming down the uh, Empire Canyon Creek, it's all coming out of that tunnel and it's still flowing today. And the other comment I wanted to make is when I look at the miners in these old photographs at the shafts, you know, when they're, where they're standing in those cages, there's no walls on those cages. There's no sides on the cages. And as you said, they drop those cages pretty fast. 
And imagine being on a cage like that and you're on the outside of the, of the crowd and you've got to hold your elbows in because <laughs> everything is whizzing by really fast. It had to be scary as all get out. Thanks. Yeah, it was an adventure. I can imagine what it must have, must have been like right. in person. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, and the last thing is more for Donovan. Um, how can we donate to the preservation efforts? Well, good. Well, that's a good. Thank you. Um, you go to the, if you go to the um, Park City Park City uh, History uh, website, there is a link to Friends of Ski Mountain Mining History there, I believe. And from there, um, you can we can you can be directed to to the um, uh, the donation site. Uh, I, I don't know if we've got Sally or Don here if they want to add to that, but I think that. Uh, Don, are you there? Donald Roll, I don't. Yeah, yes, I am. I'm here. Oh, yeah. And I'm unmuted myself. Add, do, hey, oh, Sally, do you want to add to that? Yeah. I would love to. Uh, if you'd like to just phone me, I can help you do that. We are getting to ready to do a major campaign to raise money to stabilize the shaft of the Thanes mine and the Silver King shaft both are caving and we can't start working on those two massive head frame buildings until we stop the caving of the shafts. So next summer we're going to be doing, we're going to be stabilizing the King Con orbit, which is the bottom right picture on your TV, on your screen there. And we've, we've got the engineering drawings and everything, but that, but of that, but Brian's company, Stantec, has given us estimates and we're discussing possible ways of stabilizing those shafts. And we'll be raising a little over $2 million to try to finish up those last two projects. And of course, then there's always more, but I'm going to retire when those two shafts are done and let somebody else take over. Uh, this project be, because it's my husband says amen anyway it's been a fun project and a wonderful project and it's one that I have absolutely loved being a part of as you can see we have amazing volunteers go to parkcity.org or call me at 435-640-3759 I'd love to get acquainted with you I'd love to explain to you some of the things that we're doing that you can't find on the website. And I'd love to, I'd love to make your, you a friend and a part of the effort. Thank you so much. Um, and just so everyone knows, our website is parkcityhistory.org. Um, and there is a whole section on the Friends of Ski Mountain Mining. So um, feel free to go there. And, and if you have any questions, feel free to call us. Your donations and, are tax deductible. Yes. And let me just comment on this on this slide that we're showing here now. This shows some of the photographs, some of the uh, projects that have already been completed. And, um, and so you can see these projects up on the top, uh, that's as good as it gets. We've completed those. And this one, uh, just this last year, we finished the conveyor at the Thanes. And this is the project that uh, Sally talked about we're taking on for this year. Uh, and that orb in is in bad shape, as you can see. And, and the, the thing we're trying to do is, of course, we can't put these back into pristine conditions, but what we're trying to do is stabilize them so that visitors can come and see and, and, and appreciate that mining history. Because if we don't do this, these facilities are just gonna fall into piles of rubble and, and they'll just be gone. So that, that's our mission is to try to stabilize these. Right, Sally? Right. I don't want the conversation in my living room to to inhibit what's Whee! happening here. <laughs> anyway, thanks, thanks to Stop that, Sally. <laughs> you're, you're in trouble. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Okay, so um, any other questions, comments? Um, and Donovan, did you have something you wanted to say too? I'm sorry. 
No, I, I uh, somehow lost the screen there, unfortunately, in the middle of all this. But I just want to thank all the attendees. This, <clears throat> by look at the number, this is a record number of attendees for not only for a Zoom uh, presentation, but also I think even in in-person ones. We had, we did uh, fill up the um, the annex building at the museum when we were able to do it in person. But I think we may have had more attendees today than we've had before. So thank you all for doing that and look for the, the next one on February the 10th, yeah. Well, a couple of times, uh, two years ago, we filled up the Sandy Auditorium. Well, that's right, we did, yeah. um, Named for your auntie's husband, Ted. Uh, anyway, um, we filled up the Sandy Auditorium for Silver and Snow, which was presented by Larry Warren, and also for a silly presentation of the founders of the Silver King Mine. But this is the largest online presentation we've done. And thank you so much, Brian. You did a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. We appreciate it. We really do. And thank you, everyone, for attending tonight. We, we appreciate you coming. And um, take care. And we'll see you back in February. Stay well, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Brian.